Today, we're looking at an example of exposition essays. This is a news report taken from The Economist, Jing Ji Xue Ren. Uh, do you guys know about The Economist? The Economist, uh, if you go to a bookstore and you try to buy The Economist, it looks like a magazine, but it calls itself a newspaper. And the reason is because even though it only comes out once a week instead of every day, almost everything inside is a news report. Uh, if you buy a regular magazine, you will have um, ideas, opinions, uh, lots of uh, more entertaining, lighter information. But The Economist is focused almost entirely on news, politics, economy, uh, technology, and also cultural news. Uh, so it's a newspaper and it's kind of thick. It looks like a magazine, but it's kind of thick. Um, I used to uh, go to the library to read it once a week, uh, but I gave up after I realized that it, take, it takes up way too much time to go from beginning to end every week. Uh, so instead, now I read the online version, uh, and this is taken from The Economist website. Uh, I couldn't print it directly from the website. For some strange reason, uh, when I tried to save as PDF off of the website, uh, between pages, the lines are missing. So I had to save it to an app called Pocket, which is saves uh, articles you want to read later, uh, and print it off of that. The good news is uh, the words are bigger when you read them from Pocket. This was... Uh, this story appeared near the end of June this year. Uh, so it's a news report, um, but it's not like breaking news, right? It's not something that's uh, new information. It's more like an in-depth report on some part of the situation that everyday people may not be familiar with. So, inside Ukraine's war economy. Um, right, one more thing. The Economist does not have individual authors. It doesn't give credit to individual writers. The entire magazine is uh, anonymous. The entire newspaper is treated as anonymous. Uh, so, inside Ukraine's war economy. Scroll down the Instagram profile of Kacharovska, a clothing company in Ukraine, and one can spot the precise moment that Russia invaded. So remember, the first paragraph of an exposition essay should attract the reader, should give the reader a reason to keep going. Do you think that this sentence attracts the reader? If you look at this company's Instagram, you can see exactly when the Russian invasion started. Um, it's a less usual entryway into the war on Russia. It's looking at the timeline from a very uh, on the ground perspective, not according to news reports, not according to like political statements, uh, but according to the daily life of people working at this company. So because it is a new perspective, it potentially could attract the reader's attention. They haven't seen this before. Maybe they want to see uh, how this story will continue. Uh, so it's a clothing company. Stylish photography of long legs and high heels gives way 
to walls of text calling for action and donations and unglamorous images of shoemakers in baggy clothing. So it's a clothing company, right? So uh, you would expect their Instagram page to be full of like beautiful people wearing beautiful clothes. Uh, but at one point, uh, this kind of picture disappears to be replaced by walls of text. Uh, and what this means is it's just really long paragraphs of words. Um, and and the uh, remaining images are all unglamorous, so they're not stylish. And it's instead of like fashionable models, you have shoemakers in baggy clothing, which means like large and unformed clothing. Uh, large and loose, unformed clothing, the opposite of stylish. The firm has teamed up with other outlets to produce 1,000 pairs of boots for soldiers every week. Uh, so firm means company. Uh, and this is unusual. They are working with other companies to produce boots for soldiers. Usually we expect clothing companies uh, and other similar companies to compete with each other. But in this situation, they are working together. Um, so from this first paragraph, we start to have a sense of what kind of essay this will be. First, it's from the perspective of ordinary people. Second, it's from the perspective of the private sector, which means business, instead of the public sector, which means government. And we also have our main theme, working together. Companies who should be competing are now working together to support uh, Ukraine in the war. Um, and you will also notice the writing style. The sentences are all very straightforward and clear. There's no like connecting words. There's no uh, adjectives. It's just very straightforward statement of what's going on. So it, how are we able to follow the connection between sentences if the writer doesn't give us the connection. Well, notice how the, the writing strategy goes. The first sentence says you can see the precise moment. And so we expect the next sentence to explain, OK, how can we see that precise moment? And so that's what the second sentence does, right? At that moment, uh, the ordinary photographs disappear to be replaced by things related to the war. Uh, and these things are calling for action and donations, and you have pictures of shoemakers. So then we, the reader, will then be thinking about, OK, what kind of action? Donations we can understand, right? People need money, People, uh, soldiers need supplies. But what kind of action? And why are we looking at shoemakers? It's a clothing company, not a shoe company. Why are we focused on shoes? And so we expect that information to come in the next sentence. And it does. They're making boots for soldiers. And that's why we're talking about shoemakers. So the each sentence is very clear and independent, but the paragraph flows quite uh, intuitively because each sentence prepares the reader for the next sentence. Some information that we're looking for will appear in the following sentence. And so when we read, it feels very smooth. It flows. For army boots, you need very thick leather 
explains Alina Alteretiana, the owner. Uh, so, right, by the end of this third sentence, we are most curious about the fact that companies are working together. So this is what the next paragraph talks about. You need very thick leather, uh, explains the owner of this store. The stuff she uses for women's boots is not up to scratch, so it's not thick enough. So, other companies make the parts of the shoe. Her workers sew them together. And so now we understand why these companies are working together. Uh, maybe they're not huge companies, maybe they're smaller companies, uh, and no single company is able to make the entire set of soldiers' boots, so they have to work together. The gear will be shipped across the country to branches of Ukraine's Territorial Defense Force, which are sending their orders via private message on Instagram. Right, so now that they have made the boots, how will they send the boots to the Ukrainian army? It says here that uh, Ukrainian soldiers are placing orders using private message on Instagram. Uh, so that's also one reason why the first sentence talks about the change in the company's Instagram page. It is now no longer just a place for commercials. It is also a way to communicate with the army. Um, by the way, Ukraine's Territorial Defense Force is not exactly the regular army. It's like uh, an organized um, regional um, protecting force. It's between the police and the army, something like that. So territorial defense, territory is just the area of land that belongs to the country. So the territorial defense force is responsible for everyday security, uh, catching Russian spies, uh, organizing war supplies, things like that. They're not usually sent to fight uh, on the front lines of the battle. Uh, okay, so th after they put together the boots, they, they uh, take orders through Instagram. Thanks to a crowdfunding campaign, Kaczorowska can continue to pay its workers while providing the boots free of charge. So not only is this company working with its competitors to make uh, boots for soldiers, it's also not selling them to soldiers, it's giving them away to the soldiers free of charge. And they can do that because due to a crowdfunding campaign. Uh, so this is where you go online, and you ask people to donate money for a purpose. In Chinese, this is 群众募资. So even though it's not charging money for its products, it can still keep working as a company. So this is the end of the introduction part of this essay, right? It begins with an interesting fact, and then it goes on to explain this fact. And by explaining this situation, it gives us a better picture of what's going on uh, in Ukraine, uh, like outside of the fighting, in everyday Ukrainian uh, business society. Uh, and remember, the title is Ukraine's War Economy. So this is exactly what we would expect. How does Ukraine's economy keep working when the entire country is at war? Um, if you open your essay with an example like this, uh, pay attention to how well the example represents your topic. You want, like this essay, you want to try to choose an example um, that fits your topic centrally, exactly. So by the time the reader finishes reading your example, they already have a good sense of what the rest of the essay will 
say or what the rest of the essay will focus on. Sometimes even uh, what the rest of the essay will feel like. This kind of improvisation is visible throughout Ukraine as the country struggles to keep functioning despite an all-consuming war. So it, uh, the article calls this kind of arrangement an improvisation, which here it just means that people come up with their own ideas and if it works, it works. There's no central plan. There's no government order. People come up with this themselves. And they do this even in the midst of an all consuming war. Here consume does not mean buy, it means take up. So like the situation of the war takes up all of the resources, takes up all of the time and energy. So even though everybody is now busy with the war, people are still able to make these kinds of arrangements. It's war economy. So it here is referring to Ukraine. It's war economy has so far been characterized by chaotic grassroots initiatives rather than centralized government planning. Uh, this sentence basically just explains this word improvisation. It's due to grassroots uh, initiatives. Grassroots just means from the people, from the bottom up. Uh, instead of centralized government planning. Uh, initiative here just means plan. The author wanted to avoid repeating the word plan. But the Ukrainian authorities are preparing to reshape society, including what workers produce. So in this sentence, the word but is very important. Up to this point, we have been talking about what the Ukrainian people have been doing on their own initiative. Here is our first mention of the Ukrainian government. And the first mention is uh, the direction of the government is unexpected if we have been reading to this point. It says, but, right? The Ukrainian authorities are preparing to reshape society. So why is this connection but instead of and or maybe no connection? Why is there a change in direction at this point? When we, uh, at, at, up to this point, we have been reading about people doing things and the government is not part of the picture. So it would seem like Maybe the government is busy fighting the war. Maybe the government doesn't have the time or energy to care about uh, everyday business society. But in fact, the government does care and is preparing to reshape society. That's why there's a but. The next sentence goes against our assumptions, against our expectations. Does that make sense? Uh, and by reshaping society, it also includes what workers produce. So we're still following the topic of economy. Wartime economics involves precise planning of what is needed, said Denis uh, Shmihal, Ukraine's prime minister, on March 6th. So why does the government why is it preparing to create big changes in society? Because during a war, you need precise planning. According to need. Um, so in a non-war capitalist society, companies make things, other companies sell them and people buy them. Um, and how, uh, how much stuff companies make depends on how much people want to buy. So if, if the two groups don't match, a lot of things could be wasted. 
But during a war, resources are very scarce and you can't afford to waste resources. So this prime minister says that uh, wartime economics involves precise planning of what is needed. No waste allowed. Uh, Ukraine has a prime minister. Interesting. I didn't know that. Uh, we all know Ukraine has a president, so it looks like they're using the uh, the two heads of state model of uh, government, kind of like how Taiwan we have a president and we also have a premier, Xin Zhenrianzang, right? The two people in charge of running the government. Three needs stand out. So the previous sentence says what is needed. And so the article continues by talking about, OK, what is needed? What are these needs? And it mentions three. So we can expect that in the next part of the article, we will have one, two and three. The first is to get past the initial shock of war wherever possible. This makes sense, right? So one day you wake up, your country is at war, your life is changed immensely. You have no idea whether you have to go to work. You have no idea whether you have to go to school. It's a shock. So the first thing to do is to get past this shock. The country's GDP has fallen by half in the first days since Russia invaded, reckons the central bank. So according to Ukraine's central bank, reckon means think or uh, believes. Um, when Russia invaded, Ukraine's GDP was cut by half. Can you imagine that? A country's GDP just did it. Uh, it's a huge shock. So after reading this sentence, uh, the reader is probably interested to learn why. Why exactly did the GDP fall so fast? Many people have abandoned regular duties to flee, fight, or take care of relatives. Ah, and so the reason the GDP fell so fast is because so many people stopped going to work. Either they ran away or they went to fight or they left work to take care of family members. Um, this is written using British English. So you'll notice that there's no comma here. Uh, a, B or C. In American English, we usually see a comma here. And if you think about it logically, it makes more sense to add a comma. Especially if you have a list of things like A, B and C. Uh, or you have lists, if you have a list of groups of things, so A and B, C and D, and E and F. So if your list looks like A and B, C, D and E, or A and B, C, and D and E, if you don't have that last comma, you're not quite sure where uh, how big the last group of things is. It's always clearer to add a comma before the conjunction at the end of a list, unless you're British. Although some British people also use this comma. The, the rule, the grammar rule here is very flexible, um, but in this class, I hope you do add a comma there. OK, so people have stopped going to work. Many people don't go to work. So what do we do? The government wants citizens to return to economic activity for the war effort. So of course, the government wants people to go to work. But instead of saying things like, you should go to work. It's your you know, personal responsibility or something. It instead is using the moral appeal of the war effort. In English, the war effort means 
things you do to support the war. To support your army uh, in the war. So the government is saying. Don't go to work for yourself. Don't go to work for your boss. Go to work to support Ukraine in the war. Um, if you were forced to evacuate, find a job in the new place, wrote Alexei Reznikov, the defense minister. Right, the defense minister, Guo Fang Buzang, is asking people to go to work. Um, and if you think about it, this makes sense. If your entire country stops working and the economy goes bust, then you don't have enough money and uh, to buy supplies for your army, to pay your soldiers' salaries. Um, so in order to be able to keep fighting, Ukraine's economy has to keep working. So that's the first thing, to get people back to work. The second need is to cater to places where fighting rages. To cater to something means to give that thing special treatment. Uh, the word cater originally meant uh, to provide food for an event, like a party. Um, and so it's the, the company would is create food and bring it especially for that event. Uh, so that's why we have uh, the meaning of special treatment. So you have to treat places where there's fighting uh, in a special way. By the way, notice the word rage. Rage here does not mean anger. Rage here means something more like burning. So um, where fighting rages means where there is still fighting. One official at a big Ukrainian bank describes how management wakes up each morning and decides which branches are safe to operate that day. Usually a quarter fail to open. Uh, so here the word branch means uh, like a, a branch of a bank. Uh, in Chinese, this is fen hang. So for this big bank, the management has to decide each and every morning is this place safe to open? Is that place safe to open? The situation changes every day. Uh, and in parentheses, the author tells us usually about one quarter, so one fourth of all the branches uh, are not able to open because it's not safe. When missiles are flying, companies and workers stay inside. I love this sentence. This sentence is a brilliant sentence. When we think about news reports of a war, we usually think about soldiers fighting, missiles flying, uh, presidents saying things uh, about how the war is going. But this article is exactly about everything else, right? Daily life, business, uh, how ordinary people are dealing with work during the war. So that comparison, that difference is captured in this single sentence. As missiles are flying, we're not looking at the missiles, we're looking at the people hiding inside. Uh, so like this one sentence captures the spirit of this entire article. For firms moving fuel, the risk is even graver. A uh, grave here means serious. So even graver means even more serious. Uh, notice again, in American English, there would be a comma here. Because the main sentence starts here. This is the subject. But again, our friends in the UK don't uh, feel the need to follow strict logical grammar when they use English. So we've been talking about like clothing companies, banks, and now we're talking about companies that move fuel, move gas and oil. 
When you do not know where the next clash between armies will begin, and you are towing a huge gas tank, it is like driving a bomb, says a CEO in the industry. Um, if you pay attention, you'll notice that most of the people who appear in this news report are important people, right? The head of the clothing company, prime minister, defense minister, and here we have a CEO. Um, this is part of the author's reporting process. Usually when uh, journalists report a story, they like to include different perspectives, right? Leaders, workers, government officials, ordinary people. But in this piece, most of the interviews are with leaders. And that tells us two things. One, uh, it's war and very messy and very chaotic, and it's probably hard to find people, ordinary workers, who have the time to stop and talk to uh, a British reporter. In, in like, on the other hand, leaders, part of the job of a leader is to communicate the purpose of their organization. So for the CEO, this person is not just responsible for running the company, they're also responsible for promoting the company and like um, letting people understand what's going on in their business. So in fact, for leaders, talking to journalists is part of their job. The second thing this tells us is that when the author sent this article to their editor for approval, uh, the editor will make changes and ask the author to make changes. But one thing the editor did not ask the author to do is to go interview ordinary people. For this topic, the editor felt that uh, it's OK to simply interview leaders uh, and you don't have to interview ordinary people. Why would the editor think this? Um, and one possible reason is because if the entire country is united in supporting the war effort, then the perspectives of ordinary people should be very similar to the perspectives of leaders. Um, so there's nothing really new to be gained from interviewing ordinary people. Um, but when you write an exposition essay, you should also consider this question of perspective. How are you getting your information? How are you presenting your information? Is it biased? Is it limited? Are you leaving something out by mistake? Should you try to find different sources of information? Worst of all is the chaos in towns encircled or occupied by Russian troops, such as uh, Marupol. So as you can tell from the word encircled means surrounded by. Uh, okay, so in these places, internet, water, and electricity are mostly gone. Food cannot arrive and humanitarian corridors to allow civilians to escape have reportedly been mined and fired on. Um, so humanitarian corridor, this term is put in quotation marks. This is to tell us that this is a rather special term. It's not used in the ordinary everyday sense. And we know that this term is the term used by the governments of Ukraine and Russia and like the US. This is what the governments are calling these things. What are these things? The article explains for us. They allow civilians to escape. So they are humanitarian, Rental corridors, so long. A civilian is a 
a person who is not fighting in the war. So they're not soldiers. But these uh, humanitarian corridors have reportedly been mined and fired on. To be fired on means somebody is shooting at you. To be mined means that there are bombs in the ground. Delay. So even though they're supposed to allow civilians to escape, they may not be safe. The key word here is reportedly. The Russian government, of course, denies that they're doing this. Uh, so this information comes from uh, the people on the ground and reporters, not from the official government source. Um, so in this article, they, the, it's safer not to say this is true. Instead, they say people say that this is true. So there's no internet, water, electricity, uh, less and less food, people can't get away. Workers from Naftogaz, the state oil and gas firm, risk their lives trying to fix infrastructure damaged by battles, says Yuri Vitrenko, the company's CEO. The forced shutdown of 16 gas distribution stations as of March 6th left residents in many towns without gas, including around 100,000 people in Kiev, the capital. So this information is from March 6th. Even though this piece, uh, I think, appeared around June, uh, the information is slightly older. And again, this is because uh, this report is called in-depth reporting. It's a deeper side of the story. The uh, urgency is not as strong as a normal news report. Um, so Kiev, uh, Kiev is the capital. This kind of uh, important information in a news report is often included uh, with the first mention of a uh, name. So if it's an important city, it will say blah, which is blah, blah, blah. If it's an important person, as we have been seeing, right, this person who is the CEO. Uh, very brief tags of important information follow the first mention of a name. OK, numbers. Uh, I'm sure you've all had experience reading numbers, um, but if you are often confused by how to translate numbers between English and Chinese, uh, I suggest you remember um, the Chinese translations of thousand, million, billion, and trillion. Uh, thousand is qian, million is bai wan, billion is shi yi, and trillion is zao. And if you remember that, then every time you see an English number or you hear an English number, you can quickly jump between English and Chinese and sort of adjust up and, and adjust down. It makes more sense to remember the English units instead of the Chinese units because the English units follow the commas. Every comma is a new unit in English. So the English follows the, the numbers. And so if you memorize the Chinese following the English, you can convert more easily. So up to now, we've been talking about two needs. The first need, get people back to work. The second need, um, you have to consider which places are safe to work. The final need is to assist the exodus of millions of Ukrainian refugees, typically moving in the opposite direction to the supplies for the front line. So up to now, we've been talking about uh, making things for the army, doing things to support the army. Uh, but in the opposite direction, you also have millions of Ukrainians running away from the war. Uh, from the war. 
front line. The front line of the war is just where the fighting is happening. Exodus means uh, large groups of people are leaving. This word comes from the Bible. Uh, the second book of the Old Testament is called the book of Exodus. Uh, in Chinese, we translate this as Chu Ai Ji Ji. It's when the Israelites as a people leave Egypt. So it's, again, groups of large groups of people leaving a place. Um, and this is a need because if you're sending all of your stuff to the front line, that means you don't have the resources and supplies to help people who are running in the opposite direction. So this is also something people um, have to devote energy and supplies to taking care of. Already more than 2.5 million people, equal to 6% of Ukraine's population, have crossed the borders into neighboring countries. Wow, can you imagine that? 6% of people. That's like, uh, that's like w every 20 people, one person has left. Uh, notice the use of this word, neighboring. A neighbor is, of course, somebody that is next door. So neighboring country means a country that is next door. There is huge demand for food and fuel along the routes to safety. So not just in the places where people go, but on the road that they use to get there, people need food and fuel. There's huge demand. Notice that um, here the word demand is uncountable. It doesn't say there's a huge demand. It says there's huge demand. And this is because uh, here the word demand is the abstract economic term, supply and demand, 供给. Uh, it's, it's an abstract idea. Long lines and empty shelves are a familiar picture even in unscathed cities such as Lviv in western Ukraine. So unscathed means unharmed, unhurt, that have not been destroyed by war. Um, Lviv in Chinese, I think, is Li Weifu or something. It's the major city in the west of Ukraine. So even there, uh, people are facing long lines and empty store shelves. When they go to the store, not, there's not a lot of things that they can buy. Volunteers offering ready-made soup and sandwiches brought from across the border help alleviate the shortages. Uh, alleviate means to make less, to, to make less serious. Adding to Ukrainian companies' difficulties in preserving their services is the need to divert resources to the war effort. So at this point, we have finished with the three needs. Uh, get people back to work, pay attention to where is safe and where is not. And also you have to help take care of people running from the war. So after these three needs, there are still more difficulties. So adding to the difficulties uh, is the need to divert resources to the war effort. To divert means to change the direction of. So the resources were supposed to be going here, but now we need to turn the direction and, and send them to support the war. Banks have handed over most of the armored vehicles they normally use to move cash to the army, which uses them to supply forward positions and to evacuate casualties. Um, so banks have armored vehicles that they use to move cash. Uh, if you've got if you've ever seen an ATM being refilled with money, there's probably like one of those security cars parked outside, right? 
those cars are armored. So like if somebody tries to attack the car, it's uh, probably bulletproof. It's harder to destroy the car um, to get at the money inside. But in Ukraine, banks have given these cars to the army. Uh, and the army uses them to supply forward positions. Uh, this is in keeping with the metaphor of a front line. So if the battle line is the front line, then forward positions are positions that are close to the front line. And of course, to evacuate casualties. Casualties are people that have been hurt or killed. A huge share of the fuel supply is used for military purposes. So everybody needs gas, but a lot of the gas is being given to the army. Lorry drivers are scarce. Lorry is an English uh, is a British word. Lorry in, in American English is truck. So truck drivers are scarce since many of them have stopped working and taken up arms instead. Arms here means weapons. So instead of driving trucks, they have gone to fight for the army. Food producers are scrambling to get their wares to hungry soldiers. So if there are few trucks and there's not enough fuel and there are not enough drivers, Therefore, people who make food are trying very hard to get their products to soldiers. Right? Without gas, without drivers, without trucks, it's hard to move things. To scramble to do something means to, to try very hard to struggle to do something. Scramble usually means, uh, in Chinese, it's 手忙脚乱. So it's very chaotic. They're struggling to do something. Wares. A ware is a product. Uh, the most common related words are, of course, software and hardware. Um, originally, they just meant computer products. Hardware is the physical computer products. Software is virtual computer products. Let's take a break here and we'll come back in 10 minutes. Where's the sign in sheet? Thank you. If you can't get signed in, please come here and sign in.
Thank you. 
Let's continue. So the previous paragraph has talked about how companies and people have to move resources to support the army, and so they now lack resources in daily life. Especially, uh, it, it ends by saying food producers. Uh, and then previously we have mention of long lines and empty shelves. So in this paragraph, Nonetheless, 
Many supermarkets and shops continue to be restocked overnight. So even with all of these challenges, many shops still have enough things to sell. Nova Poshta, a private postal service, has used its logistics network to ship tons of humanitarian mail across the country. So this company is a private postal service. So it sends mail, but it's not a government business. It's a private business. So think of it like um, FedEx or DHL or UPS. Uh, and it uses its logistics network. Logistics is the uh, it's the the discipline of sending things. Uh, in Chinese, we call this wu liu. Tons uh, in American English is just T O N. And they call this mail humanitarian mail uh, because these are essential supplies. So it's humanitarian, and uh, Ship here just means send, right? To ship something means to send something. Banks are still operating remarkably smoothly thanks to nearly a decade of reform. Pensions and salaries are still being paid. A pension is uh, after you retire, a company pays for your retirement. Shops are encouraged to take payments with cards rather than cash, since cash needs to be moved around. So the big challenge is logistics, right? Moving stuff. So shops now encourage paying with cards because if they pay with cash, the cash needs to be moved. You'll notice that when I'm when I'm explaining these sentences, I'm basically just repeating them. This is how good the writing is. There's no better way to say what it says. Um, so I end up just repeating myself. Ukraine's here, Ukraine's big banks quickly implemented a new scheme to allow customers paying with cards at stores to withdraw up to 6,000 hryvnia in cash at the same time in the hope of reducing the amount of cash that retailers would need to ship to their vaults. Um, so Ukraine's big banks have uh, started using a new plan. Uh, British English likes to use the word scheme, but in American English, a scheme is usually an evil plan uh, or like a corrupt plan. In British English, it's just a plan. So what is this plan? If you buy something with a card, you can also withdraw up to 6,000 hryvnia or uh, 200 US dollars. Um, so in Taiwan, I don't think we have this, but in the US, if you buy something with a, a credit card, the store clerk will ask you, do you want cash back? Which means, do you want to take uh, do you want to um, take money from your credit and turn it into cash that you can take away in your pocket? Um, the idea is when you buy something with a credit card, you're spending money. So do you want to spend a little more money and turn it into cash? Uh, of course, you have to pay for that cash in your next credit card bill. Um, so here, um, the idea is companies encourage customers to take out cash from their credit card because if they have if the store has too much cash they have to move it uh, to their vaults and usually the vault is somewhere else so you, again they have to move physical cash uh, so by encouraging people to withdraw cash uh, they can reduce the amount of money that they have to physically move. Russia has begun to target fuel supplies in the hope of debilitating the Ukrainian army. 
This is also a very good sentence. I love this sentence. Up to this point, we have been talking about Ukraine, Ukrainian people, Ukrainian business, Ukrainian government. This is the first mention of Russia. And of course, if you're reading this story, you probably support Ukraine in the war. So to, to, to the reader, Russia is the bad guy. So how does this sentence present the bad guy? It doesn't like carefully present them. It doesn't like introduce them. It use, it's the first word of this paragraph, Russia, big bad Russia. And that adds to the sense of danger in this story. Uh, when you're immediately faced with the enemy, it adds to the sense of danger. Um, and this is the atmosphere of this story, right? Missiles are flying, resources are scarce, and now you have this big bad enemy in front of you. Russia has begun to target fuel supplies. To target means to aim at, uh, to try to hit fuel supplies, to try to debilitate the Ukrainian army. Notice the, the middle of this word. This kind of looks like ability, right? To debilitate means to take away their ability. Uh, so Ukraine already lacks fuel. Now Russia is attacking fuel supplies. On February 27th, a fuel depot belonging to KLO, a popular chain of petrol stations in Kiev, was hit by a Russian missile. So a fuel depot is where they store the fuel, Tsangku. Uh, and KLO is a chain of petrol stations. This again is British English. In American English, we call this a gas station, uh, So this is a private oil like uh, seller company and their fuel storage was hit by a Russian missile. So not the Ukrainian army, a private company. The firm has also seen imports of petrol from Lithuania via Belarus cut off by order of the Belarusian government, which is closely allied with Russia. So on the one hand, this company's oil station is destroyed, uh, oil storage station is destroyed. On the other hand, their imports, Jinkoda, have been uh, some of their imports have been cut off. So supply uh, on the one hand is being destroyed. On the other hand, they can't get new supply. Again, petrol is gas. Lithuania in Chinese is Li Tao Wan. Belarus in Chinese is Bai Elo Si. And why would Belarus cut off their gas? Because Belarus is closely allied with Russia. They're on the same side. But KLO can still import petrol from EU countries without too much trouble. Uh, again, I love uh, this, this word, but, especially if you look at these two, uh, like this entire paragraph. You start with a bad guy and you talk about all the terrible things that bad guy is doing. But with this one simple word, you change the direction and you give hope back to the story. Uh, there's still another source. There's not too much trouble. Another good thing, demand is also down, which is uh, as so much normal activity has stopped. Uh, even though a lot of normal activity has stopped, this counts as a bad thing. But in this case, we're talking about this company. So the fact that demand is down is a good thing because they're already lacking supply. And that's why it uses the word also. It moves in the same direction. Both of these sentences are good things. Firms that a month ago were fierce rivals are now sharing fuel and staff. Uh, again, the topic, the theme of cooperation. When you don't have enough fuel, when you don't have enough people, you start to work together. Uh, this word fierce, in Chinese we call this xiongmongde, 
but actually fierce is it's kind of like above I said rage, right? Rage is not anger, it's burning. Fierce here does not mean uh, violent. It means intense. Chang intense. The agricultural sector is suffering too. Uh, so we've been talking about commercial, right? Uh, banks, industry, uh, making things and oil. Now we're talking about agriculture, farming and growing food. The cost of fertilizer and pesticide have climbed, which may impinge on the next crop sowing season, which should begin by the end of this month. Fertilizer is to help plants grow. Pesticide is to kill, uh, to kill bugs. And the cost of both have gone up probably because the cost of oil went up. You need oil to make fertilizer and pesticide. And this may impinge on, which means may have an impact on uh, the next crop sowing season. To sow crops, S-O-W, to sow crops is to plant uh, seeds for the new growth of plants. Uh, which should begin by the end of this month. So this could be a little worrisome. It, the deadline is coming. MHP, the country's biggest poultry producer, points to the interrupted supply of feed additives for its chickens and turkeys among its worries. They are a poultry produ uh, producer. Poultry just means chicken. So this company grows chickens. Uh, and turkeys related to chickens. And they lack feed additives. Feed is a noun, which means the food that you give farm animals is called feed. Uh, so things that they would add to this feed, uh, they can no longer get. What would you add to chicken food? Do you guys know? Have you raised chickens before? Um, so you give them the food, right? But you also would add things like vitamins, uh, antibiotics. Um, antibiotics is what? Um, you would add things that help them to grow bigger and fatter and produce more meat. Many firms are asking the government for help with spiraling costs. Spiral is this shape. It's a circle that doesn't close. Um, in this case, it means it keeps going up. But sometimes a spiral can mean it keeps going down. Uh, for example, if someone says that their mental health is spiraling, it means that their mental health is decreasing. They keep, keep getting locked into their own negative thoughts. Uh, but in, in terms of costs, usually it means going up. On March 8th, it banned, it is the government, right? Is asking the government for help. So on March 8th, the government banned the export of salt, sugar, meat, and wheat, xiaomai, to help bolster local stores. Bolster means to add to, to make more, to, to build up more. Stores here does not mean places that sell things. A store is the abstract noun for storage. Keeping Ukrainians fed is getting harder. The state has imposed controls on the prices of essential goods. Uh, to impose control on prices, which means to uh, order prices not to go above a certain number, to keep prices stable and low. It has also set up bodies to scrutinize price gouging. So here bodies does not mean human bodies. Bodies means government organizations. Scrutinize means to examine. Price gouging means to raise prices during an emergency. 
So the government has set up organizations to check if people are raising prices during this emergency. A new coordination center for food, medicine, water, and fuel keeps tabs on the supplies of those essentials. To keep tabs on means to check, to continuously check. Um, so when the previous sentence says there are new organizations, this is one example. But you'll notice that the article does not say, for example. Because if the first sentence says there are some new organizations and the next sentence gives you an organization and says that it is new, then the reader already knows that this is an example. You don't have to tell the reader that it's an example. Uh, notice the British spelling of center. In American English, it is ER. Uh, so this organization keeps track of those essentials. Which essentials? Food, medicine, water, and fuel, the things that are in its name. The state, so the government, needs to make sure it keeps itself fed too. It is marshalling funds, borrowing from the IMF, among others, and issuing war bonds. To marshal something means to gather things, to raise things. In Chinese, we would call this something like Zao Bing Mai Ma. Uh, and so how is it gathering more money? Funds here means money. It borrows from the IMF, International Monetary Fund, Guo Ji Huo Bi Ji Jing, I think it's Chinese name, uh, among, other, among others. So it's borrowing from the IMF, borrowing from other people, and issuing war bonds. A bond is, if you buy a bond from a government, the government agrees to pay you a little more money at when the bond expires. A war bond is actually the same as a bond. Uh, as, I, as I just said, uh, the government sells you a piece of paper for a certain price, and the paper says, for example, five years later, uh, the government will give you that amount of money plus a little bit more. So it's a kind of investment. Um, a war bond works the same as a regular bond, except that people know the government is fighting a war. There is more risk because if the government loses the war, you lose your money. Its first post-invasion bond issued on March 1st, offered a yield of 11%. So 11% is the extra amount of money the government says it will give you. That part is called a yield. The word yield originally just means to give or to give way. Uh, uh, you would use the word yield. Um, by the way, an ordinary bond would give you a yield of like 1% or 2%. So 11% is pretty high. But here the author says this is an impressively low interest rate for a country at risk of imminent conquest. So if everybody thinks you're going to lose the war, usually it would not be as low as 11%. Imminent conquest which means it will soon be de defeated. Uh, uh, imminent, which it will happen soon. So this sentence is actually sarcastic. Everybody who says Ukraine is going to lose the war very soon, uh, apparently the market disagrees. The government has posted online the numbers of its various cryptocurrency wallets. 
from Bitcoin to Dogecoin to solicit anonymous donations. So the government is selling war bonds. It is also asking people to donate Bitcoin, uh, and Dogecoin, um, This is back when Bitcoins was actually worth a lot of money. Bitcoin now is not worth a lot anymore. Uh, solicit means to ask for, to ask for anonymous donations. The sale of war-themed NFTs to bolster military coffers is also in the works. In the works means it is being planned. It might happen soon. Bolster, we said, is add to. A coffer is a thing you use to collect coins. So here it just means uh, their money, to add to their the military's money. So what is an NFT? Have you guys heard of this before? Uh, in English, it's a non-fungible token. What is token? Um, the idea is that you take an object and you register it using Bitcoin or Ethereum or some kind of digital currency. And once you register it, that record cannot be changed, cannot be deleted. And so it's a way to prove uh, forever that you own this thing. And so it's more, it's usually seen as more valuable than simply buying something. If you buy something and you lose your receipt, you can't prove that it belongs to you if somebody steals it. Uh, but in theory, NFTs are much more secure. Uh, it turns out there are also situations where NFTs are not secure. But for people who believe that kind of thing, they might be willing to spend more money to buy something uh, with an NFT. And so Ukraine is also preparing to sell those. In addition to paying for the war itself, the government faces other new expenses. A payment of 6,500 hryvnias, or 215 US dollars, to all workers who have lost their jobs due to the invasion, for instance. Uh, so remember back in the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, countries around the world would pay their citizens to stay home and not go to work. Uh, well, in this case, the Ukrainian government is giving money to people who have lost their jobs because of the war. And so the government has to have a way to pay for this. It is also trying to sustain the economy by loosening restrictions. Sustain means to keep going, to keep up. Buying medication no longer requires a prescription in most cases. So in most cases in Ukraine, if you need medicine, you don't need to go to a doctor and ask the doctor to write you a prescription. You can just go buy the medicine. So prescription is a doctor's note for medicine, in this case. Under martial law, customs duties have been deferred allowing food and fuel to enter the country quickly and cheaply. Martial law is a kind of law, right? It's called martial law. Martial means fighting or war. So in Chinese, this is called jie yin. Uh, customs duties. Customs means import export, jing chu kou. Duties is the kind of tax you need to pay for imports and exports. So customs duties are a kind of tax, have been deferred, so not waived. Um, if you no longer need to pay the tax, that is called waive, to waive a tax. Actually, you should be able to see this, right? W-A-I-V-E, waive, there you go. Um, but here it says deferred. Deferred means postponed. You have to pay it later. 
but at this point, you don't have to pay, so imports can enter faster and cheaper, especially food and fuel, which are very desperately needed at this point. The war economy will roll on. Once you see this sentence, you know this is the conclusion. To roll on uh, here means to keep going. Uh, but it's a very interesting image because it's used to describe tanks. Tanks roll on, they keep going forward. But here it's not talking about tanks. It's not talking about the war. It's talking about the war economy will roll on. Uh, you can tell this is the example because it starts moving to the future, right? It's saying what will happen in the future. The war economy will roll on. It must. Uh, the provision of services avoids humanitarian catastrophe and allows citizens to stay put and defend their country. The word provision is the noun of provide. So the providing of services uh, allows people to stay in their country to fight. So why must the economy keep going? Because if, it, if the economy fails, then Ukraine can't keep fighting the war. So this must is not description. This must is a call. Uh, as the fighting expands, keeping the lights on will become ever trickier. Keeping the lights on means you keep paying your power bill. You keep paying the power company, which means you keep making money in order to pay the power company. So in this case, keeping the lights on means to keep the economy going. Will become trickier, which means harder and harder. But so far, the state and business have cooperated remarkably smoothly, stitched together like the upper and sole of a boot. So here, this image is the same image that we started with. Remember the clothing company, uh, working with other companies, and when other companies send different parts of the boot, this company puts it together. So that's what this image is, stitched together, uh, the upper and sole of a boot. The sole of a shoe is the part that, that touches the ground, is the sole of a, sh of a shoe. So just like that company is putting shoes together, the Ukrainian government and Ukrainian society are also working together. So it looks toward the future, but it is not too optimistic. It says so far, so maybe things might change. We don't know. OK. Do you have questions about this example essay? OK, so um, last week I mentioned that this week you will be divided into groups and next week you will do peer review. So what is peer review? How do you do it? Uh, I have posted some guidelines onto Moodle. I'll guide you through the key points. So first, after I divide you into groups, you will have to agree on a deadline to exchange your essays with your group members before the next class. So I don't want you to come here and then read your group members essays for the first time. I want you to read them before coming to class. Read them, think of things that you can say to improve the essays, advice that you can give and come to class prepared. If you're not able to finish your essay before that deadline, please include the rest of your ideas, a sketch or plan for the unfinished part. That way your group members know how you plan to end the essay 
even if you have not yet actually had time to finish writing. Now, when you read your group members essays, don't focus on mistakes. That's my job, right? I will pick out the spelling and grammar mistakes. Instead, think about your experience as a reader. Are some parts unclear? Are some parts confusing? Do you think this part needs more detail? Does that part need more information? That kind of thing. Of course, if there are so many mistakes that you start getting annoyed or confused, you can talk about those, but they should not be the main focus. Now, next week when you come here, uh, you will divide into your groups and you will give feedback to your group members. Uh, I hope you can follow this kind of order. First, talk about one person's essay. Uh, one classmate will talk. Then the next classmate will talk. Then the third classmate will talk. And afterward, if the author wants to, the author can reply. The author doesn't have to reply. And then after you finish talking about the first essay, you move on to the next essay. One classmate will talk. The second classmate will talk. The third classmate will talk and the author can choose whether to reply. The point is to not start a conversation. Because once you start a conversation, it will keep going and going and you won't have enough time. Uh, and sometimes if the conversation goes in the wrong direction, it might turn into an argument and we don't want to have arguments. The point is to listen to other people's reading experience and their suggestions. So uh, if you follow this order, right? Essay one and then ABC, essay two, ABC. After you finish, if you have more time, then you can continue talking about uh, specific pieces of advice, but please first try to finish talking about all four essays before you start a conversation. When you're talking about an essay, when you're giving feedback, try not to ask things like, is this true? Is this correct? Are you sure? Um, the point is not to make sure the essay is accurate. The point is to make sure the essay is smooth and uh, the reader has a good experience. Uh, and if you start asking the author, is this right? Are you sure? It feels like you don't trust the author uh, and that can be a little bit awkward. Um, besides, even when you're writing an exposition essay, the point is not, are these facts correct? The point is, did you write an essay that readers will want to read? And after they finish reading, will they think it has been a good use of time? It didn't waste their time. Uh, now, when you are the author and somebody is giving you advice, it can feel very uncomfortable. You can feel like maybe they didn't understand what you're trying to say. It can feel like they're idiots. They don't understand at all. But remember, the reader is going off of what you have written. If you end up in the future writing for like a newspaper or a website and somebody misunderstands what you write, you don't have the chance to go around correcting people. You can only communicate using the thing that you have written. So if the reader uh, has an experience that is not what you wanted to give them, that's your problem as the author. You have to make you have to try to give the reader the kind of experience that you want them to have. Now, every reader's experience is always right. They are only reading what you have written, nothing else. But different readers can have different experiences. 
So if two group members give you opposite advice, it is your job as the author to decide what to do. So the reader's experience is always right, but it is the author's choice how to respond to that experience. Does that make sense? So next week, we're not coming here to chat. We're coming here to engage in a structured activity of giving feedback. Uh, and if you finish early, you can keep talking. You can begin correct, revising immediately, uh, or you can leave early. And n the next week, so two weeks later, you have to hand in a written essay to me. OK, do you have questions? OK, so um, I have actually already divided you into groups. If you check Microsoft Teams, uh, you will see your group number. Um, but just to make sure, I'm going to go through each group to make sure you guys know which group you're in. Um, I think we can stop recording at this point.